Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Just going to give people another minute or two to log in, get their audio connected, and then we'll go ahead and get started. Hey everyone, if you're just joining, we're just giving everyone a minute to hop in. The waiting room is just like, like fluctuating. <laughs> so I wanna give everyone a chance to get in and get connected. All right, well, it's a minute past the hour, so we can go ahead and get started and, and just want to say welcome back. We're excited about today's session. Today uh, really marks a transition in the program. So uh, first of all, we're so grateful for all of you for uh, hanging in with us throughout the first, the first portion of racial equity training with Race Forward. Again, we're going to miss Shanna and Larry, but they will be available to you through office hours throughout the remainder of the program. Also. Um, you know, via email, or if you want to set up time to connect with them as you're uh, kind of working through whatever step you're on with your tool and with your communities. Um, we are just so excited to make a transition into our small business training session, so to speak. Uh, so again, this is really where we see the theoretical move to the practical, and we have a really great uh, roster of speakers who are you know, joining us today and over the next couple of weeks. And with that, I am going to pass it over to Sylvie Howard, who has been kind of behind the scenes. You may have noticed her in a, in a few of our trainings so far, but she is the founder and CEO of Equitable Cities Consulting, and she has been helping us put together um, speakers and the uh, sort of focus for each of the small business training sessions. So she has been a great partner in putting together this portion of the project and she will also be available to you as, as an additional resource so um, we encourage you throughout to pop questions into the chat and we will go ahead and get to them when we move into our Q&A portion and then after our speakers are through their presentations please feel free we'll, we'll move into an, a formal Q&A where you can unmute yourself ask your questions um, and again if you know make use of the chat and we're, we're so excited to be here. So with that, I'll go ahead and pass it over to you, Sylvie. Okay, great. Thanks, Sloan. Hi, everyone. Um, so as Sloan said, I, I popped in quickly in the, last, um, in the last session. So probably most of you saw me then, um, but I'm Sylvie Gallier Howard. I'll be helping to moderate today um, so that Therese and Jennifer can focus on their presentations if, if questions pop up in the chat and things like that. And then when we get to the Q&A, um, so um, I'm not going to talk too long. I'm just going to say who we have speaking today and then um, be helping out during the session. So, uh, Sylvia, you want to unmute for a second? That Thanks. <laughs> I don't know why I did that. So, so Sharice, is it Conanon? Okay, good. Sharice Conan and Johnson, who is a managing partner with Next Street, um, will be kicking us off. And then she'll be followed by Jennifer Steinfeld, who's the Director of Entrepreneurship and Economic Development for the National League of Cities. So Sharice, I'm going to kick it over to you. Uh, sounds good. Can you all hear me? Yes. And you see my presentation? All good things. All good things. Uh, first of all, thank you to the Philadelphia Fed and, and Sylvie. Uh, it's, it's exciting to be here and I am just overjoyed for the opportunity to talk to you about uh, what it means to, uh, for us as we as a country um, are marching toward an equitable small business recovery. And I'm gonna focus on the word equitable, uh, which we'll get into. Uh, you should know that I have been reading some of uh, the 
litany of trainings that you are undergoing. And so I just want to salute you all for being present and going through this. And so if you journey with me for a few minutes, uh, we'll, we'll get into the topic. Uh, it's important to know that I come to this work uh, from a couple of different hats. The first, I have a background in traditional finance. Uh, I came from Wall Street, uh, investing in capital markets uh, and pre predominantly U.S. stocks. I ended up leaving that field to become a small business owner, to become an entrepreneur. And so I lived the life of entrepreneurship, and I still do, quite frankly, uh, as I have my own side hustle outside of my time at Next Street. Uh, and so um, this is deeply personal for me, uh, as I've experienced personally some of the challenges, but also some of the joys of being an entrepreneur. And so with that, I want to tell you a little bit about Next Street. For those of you unfamiliar with who we are and what we do, uh, just so you have a taste of how we show up in the small business ecosystem. And we are a for-profit, mission-oriented firm. We work with institutions across the small business infrastructure, and you'll hear me say that term, small business infrastructure, a lot over the next uh, few minutes here. Uh, but that means institutions like governments, philanthropy, financial institutions, corporates, all of these institutions who want to mobilize how capital and customers and capabilities get to small businesses and entrepreneurs, particularly those that have been systemically held back because of their race, because of their ethnicity, because of their class, because of their gender, because of their sexual orientation. Um, obviously in the last 18 months, we've also been dealing with uh, the trauma uh, of what is going on around race, uh, what has been going on for centuries, but coming more obviously to the forefront. And so um, it's our goal uh, to live out also anti-racist values um, as we have this ultimate vision, which is create a more in inclusive US economy. On the bottom left-hand corner of this page, you'll see just a smattering of the types of clients in those larger institutional buckets uh, that I referred to, just to give you a little bit of flavor. And specifically on the right-hand side of this page, uh, just want to give you a, a bit of a sense of how we do what we do. This first bucket in terms of providing research and insights on the state of small business, which we'll talk about um, in a few more minutes. Uh, the second uh, way in which we do our work is providing direct programming to small businesses and entrepreneurs by way of classes and training, uh, technical assistance in the economic development vernacular, as well as designing programs. And then lastly, through our capital business, making sure that entrepreneurs and small businesses and the institutions that support them can fundraise and get the right capital that they need. And so um, I want to go to you all now, uh, and I want to run this first poll. Uh, and so I, I know you might not have thought you were going to participate, but uh, I'd love for you to be able to answer this question. Um, what are the biggest needs of your organization today? And you can pick more than one if that applies. Is it reaching small business owners? Is it understanding all the programs that exist to support the small businesses you serve? Is it access to impact measurement and data collection tools? Is it access to best in class products and services to support the businesses you serve? Is it around collaborating with partners in the markets? I know we have a, a nice diverse group across the country. Or is it about insights into the needs of small businesses? Just click on one. I'll give you five more seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Let's close the poll. Let's see where folks are landing. Oh, so we have uh, a variety of needs here. I said the, the biggest two, the top two, understanding all the programs that exist to support, support small businesses. And so we'll get into some of that. Uh, another big one here, insights into the needs of small businesses. We'll definitely get into that. Um, and then I see also kind of followed by reaching small business owners. And I'll take you through a few case studies to, to show you how we've done it with uh, different ecosystems around the country. And then impact measurement. And so that's just really helpful as, as uh, Jen and I uh, are trying to understand where you are coming to this work now. And so uh, we're going to first get into that current state of small business. Uh, we're then going to get into understanding a little bit more about the needs and different programs that have 
truly been, I would say, best in class around COVID-19 and recovery efforts. And then we're going to talk about what does it take to build an equitable ecosystem? What are some guiding principles? What can we learn from some other markets? And how can you all prepare yourselves to collaborate as we move forward? So I want you to think about the needs that you of your organization that you just expressed as I go through. And again, if you have questions, put, drop them in the chat. But ultimately, I want you to think about um, how this information can help you in your own organization. And so, uh, you should know about me and about Next Street. Uh, we have some strong beliefs. And the first one uh, to ground us is that the small business infrastructure is broken. I'm going to get into why that is the case, but uh, we start out with that assumption because underlying the reasons why, it's important to understand then how do we have solutions to address that. Um, the second fundamental belief is that we are working within traditional systems. Um, and we are working around traditional systems while still trying to change them at the same time. I think you are small business heroes. Uh, think of yourselves as change agents. All of that's gonna be important to understand the very large structural barriers that are in place sometimes uh, when we're trying to do the work of equitable small business, particularly in environments like COVID-19 and uh, that are racially charged. Uh, the third belief is that we each have a role to play, right? Uh, you are not excused from your role uh, as, as an individual or as an organization. And I wanna challenge you as we go through some of this information, where do you see yourself and in the interventions in providing the support that's needed? And that's, I, I feel like going to help you uh, figure this all out. Um, I wanna then also ground us in why this is so important. You know. I often ask myself the question, to what end, right? To what end are we using small businesses as a lever for our country? And the reasons are uh, data-driven and clear. Uh, small businesses are the engines of inclusive economic growth in this country. They create almost two thirds of the net new private sector jobs and they have over the last couple of decades. When you have a small business owner in a family, uh, the median net worth of that family is 5x the median net worth of a family that doesn't have a small business owner. And actually, when you talk about small business owners of color, that number is 10 times. Think about that for a second, 10 times, particularly for Black and Latinx. And so wealth and small business do go hand in hand. It can be one lever that we all use to not only build wealth, but close some wealth gaps that exist between populations. And we all have read some of the stats recently in terms of uh, the difference, uh, white families having 10 times as much wealth than black families and eight times as uh, our Latino um, families. Small businesses also are responsible uh, for the fact that money stays within the community. 68% of every $100 spent at a local st small business stays in that community, that's powerful in terms of the recycling of dollars, creating jobs in that local economy uh, versus 42% spent on a non-local business. And so uh, all small businesses, and I, I have this also with me though, have certain challenges. Everybody needs some capital. 52% of all small businesses have a financing shortfall or unmet financing need. Number one problem cited by uh, particularly small businesses in Boston. I would think that this is the case for some of the other cities. Uh, finding customers and getting customers and retaining those customers is one of the biggest challenges. And then five, access to services. And I don't mean just any services, but quality services. So I wanna ask you now, uh, as you think about access to capital, access to customers, access to services, let's put on another poll here. And what are the greatest needs of the small businesses that you serve? Or uh, when you, if you don't serve any small businesses today, as you have been reading, and you know, I know you know some small business owners just in your own networks, uh, what do you think are some of the biggest challenges? Um, you can pick more than one, uh, but you can also pick one. So I'm gonna give you five, four, three, two, one. We're gonna close that poll. Um, hmm, access to capital uh, and followed by access to quality services and supports um, and then customers. So all three, I think, are important, uh, but 
thank you for sharing a bit with me on where you're seeing some of the pain points and also for your colleagues to see uh, what's bubbling up to the top. Um, you focused in on the access to capital one and I, I couldn't plant this, but as I move on to some of the current state here, it's important to know that when I talk about, again, this broken small business infrastructure, a big piece of it is around the capital and it's around a broken capital system. Uh, just a few stats that I want you to be mindful of, less than 1% of venture funding goes to black founders. Um, two, when we talk about debt products though, the loan denial rates for business owners of color are twice as high as, as those of their white business owners. And then uh, when loans are given, business owners of color pay interest rates that are 22% higher than their white business owners. And the average loan of a business owned by a person of color is 39% smaller than the average loan of a white owned business. Um, and so this last stat in terms of business owners of color that do get funding receive their full amount um, sought 28% less often than their white counterparts. These stats might be jarring and they should be because they are. Uh, the reality is, is that um, these exist because again, we have a separate and unequal infrastructure, particularly for business owners of color. Last year during COVID-19, specifically in 2020, the government, the US government spent over a trillion dollars in small business. It was the largest uh, amount of money spent in the history around small business in any given year. We're set to spend over $100 billion uh, going forward for the next five years. The reality, though, is that 10% of government funding, government funding, reaches Black and Latino business owners despite making up over 30% of all small businesses. So again, I told you I would get into why this is the case. One, and I don't want to shy away from this, I go right in, systemic bias is real. Um, and I just showed you some of the stats on the capital side, but we have to acknowledge the history of racism, the history of policies and laws that have prevented some of the ways in which business owners of color have been locked out of traditional systems. The second piece here is around broken channels. Uh, capital and resources have to get distributed. And so mainstream financial institutions, particularly when we talk about government funding, are the dominant by the tune of 98% of all funding from the government goes through traditional financial institutions. Whereas only 2% goes through some of the local providers such as community development financial institutions or CDFI. This is, this is a challenge. And so again, we're, we're all working, but we have to recognize some of these issues and work toward addressing these. Um, and so um, I wanna though say that there is hope um, and that's why we're working on a lot of initiatives to address this. And with that hope, some of the more recent trends give us some, some confidence that uh, small business owners themselves aren't afraid to keep starting businesses. The graph you see on the left uh, with the blue, the dark blue bars, it's the applications for small business formation. And so this is US census data. And you can see uh, over the last pretty much 11 years, that number has been hovering around 2.5 to 3.2 million. But as we inched up into 2020 and uh, during uh, the pandemic, you know, those applications in July of 2020 have been up more than 50% than pre-pandemic levels. And that's what you see, um, you know, here in this light blue. And so uh, we're encouraged by the new starts and you might ask the question of, well, who's starting these businesses? That's what takes me to the graph on the right. Uh, what you see here, this is Race of Entrepreneurship from the Kauffman Foundation. As many of you are aware, uh, does a lot of great research on the state of entrepreneurship. And this is through February, 2021. Uh, the medium blue bar uh, is uh, you know, Hispanic and the yellow bar is Asian. The lighter blue bar is black and the more darker blue bar is white, but you can see in the last couple of years, it's the business owners of color that actually have been starting more of the businesses. So you take some of the challenges along with the opportunity for many of the demographics that have been systemically held back. Um, and there's a case to be made that we need to be investing in these businesses. 
uh, in order to equitably rebuild. And so I wanna take a pause here. Um, Sylvie, did, I see you coming off mute, everything okay? Yeah, I was just gonna, there's one question that I thought was would be good to ask okay. you right now. So there's a question from Hannah um, asking how are small business defined in this data? Um, like what threshold does the data use? Yep. Um, most of this data that I've shared here is uh, census data and defining small businesses as under 500 employees. So it is wide. Um, I would say the majority though of, uh, which gets to the next poll question. Uh, um, how many of you can tell me how many small businesses there are in the US? You only get one choice this time. How many small businesses are there in the US? I'm gonna give you a few more seconds because you might have to think about this one. Uh, one, two, three, four, and we'll close it at five. Oh, so, you know, uh, 32 million uh, is looks like the lead. And I have to tell you, you're correct. Um, you know, uh, some of you said 47 million. I wish we're going to get there soon. Um, and for the others, you know, we're doing a little bit better. So of these 32 million, though, small businesses in the United States, 80 percent, 80 percent are sole proprietors. So which goes to tell you that though the majority of small businesses in, the com in this country are small and typically owned uh, and run by, by one person. Uh, so with that, now you might be saying, so what are the solutions, Sharice? Uh, talk to me, right? You talk to me about uh, some of the needs, some of the challenges, being encouraged by the new starts. And I wanna share with you a case study from uh, work that we have been involved in in Cook County, uh, which is in Illinois, in which the city of Chicago sits in. And in Cook County, at the start of COVID-19, um, we got together, and I say we got together, meaning that uh, for the two years prior to COVID-19 in the spring of 2020, we had been working with roughly 35 stakeholders across the small business infrastructure in order to understand the lay of the land in Cook County. And so that means how many businesses exist? How many business owners of color exist? What industries are growing? Where, what industries are those small businesses in? And so when COVID-19 hit, we went to the same group of 35 stakeholders and said, um, based on some of the needs that were found in that assessment, and a big part of the need is access to flexible capital, um, as many of you have pointed out, and also access to quality services, also which came up second for you all. And we decided, you know what, if, if many of the small businesses who weren't getting the PPP dollars at the time, the Paycheck Protection Plan dollars, uh, they still needed some funding. And so we designed a program with Cook County that paired advice and education. We, we moved away from the language of technical assistance, but advice and education uh, what you see in the optional group webinars and the one-on-one -on -one business advising with recovery grants in the amount of $10,000 each. Uh, we had over uh, 35, many of those same partners that had been journeying with us for the prior two years, sign up to be part of the Cook County Small Business Assistance Program. What you see on the right here, right-hand side here is uh, the dedicated website that was put up uh, in order for businesses to sign up directly and be routed to different business service organizations to get that advice and make sure that they had some shared intake tools, some shared education, shared webinars, and were able to leverage each of their strengths. Some business service organizations are better at helping small businesses in marketing. Others are better at helping them fi finance and have access to capital. And so we had to make sure we understood those and have a more standardized, but also um, tailored to the needs of businesses in this market, uh, the kind of education and the kind of advice they would get. So what were the results? Uh, this chart really shows we were able to get out roughly 17 million in recovery grants, and that equated to roughly uh, 1,700 small businesses. And in addition to that, which had received grants, another 2,000 had received that education and advice. And you can see here, um, I wanna orient your eye to the bar on the left. Um, you can see that 
the kinds of awardees by uh, race or ethnicity. Uh, black participants received 36%, um, and you can see white 31.7, and then Hispanic um, seven, almost 17%, followed by some of the other demographics. Women, uh, which is the middle bars here, received 47% of the um, applications, but also of the, the awardees. Um, and then you can see in terms of the uh, woman owned, people of color owned, veteran owned and owned with the disabilities. So we were able to target and intentionally uh, through this network also of marketing and referral partners get to the businesses that have been you know, more systemically shut out. And that was a, such a strong impact for us we're still working with many of these businesses as we've had follow-on sessions. And that's been one of the guiding lights for us. One, intentionality, two, the collaboration, and three, shared tools so that we can use as a full ecosystem to drive the outcomes that we wanna see. Um, and so I, I kind of laid some of those out here. What were the strengths of this program? It takes immediate and strong coordination, uh, a commitment to impact, uh, commitment to identifying who are the intended businesses that you want to hit with a particular program, those shared resources, um, and then how do you then attract others? Uh, because uh, there can often be this very real competitiveness amongst different service organizations, and it can sometimes emanate from a scarcity mentality that there's a fixed number of resources, and if I didn't get mine, someone else uh, is not going to get theirs. Uh, we, we had to unbuckle uh, that line of thinking, we, we can all get some um, if we actually uh, have a mantra of, you know, together uh, we are stronger. And that's really what was one of our guiding lights. Um, on this right-hand side of the page, things that we're still working on, how do we make sure that we continue to increase the capacity of the business service organizations and the collaboration partners? How do we make sure that that intake process that we use and try to streamline and standardize uh, is, is truly that streamlined and is technology enabled, we were able to do so. How do we also make sure that the matchmaking that is involved with matching businesses to the right service providers happens again in an automated, but also in a way that almost like a concierge guides a small business so they understand the evolution of where to go and where to go when. Um, and we're working on things such as peer learning networks, new education delivery formats, uh, testing a lot of asynchronous learning model, modules now, and then how do we make sure that our network and the belief that we are stronger together continues to hold, particularly as more resources come. Sylvia, I see you. There's one other question, another one about size. What, um, um, from Juana Jean about what size were the businesses that got the recovery grants for this program? For this program, we had an intended focus of 20 employees or less. Yeah, so we want to focus on some of the smaller businesses that have been locked out of the PPP funding. So the, one of the keys to success here in Cook County is that many of the partners are represented on this slide. It's, it's very colorful. Um, think about yourself, where, where might you sit in these roles? Uh, but it takes, and this is why it gets back to everyone has a role to play. Uh, Cook County is the municipality. The, some of the funding was funded and really the catalytic initial funding by the philanthropic community led by the Chicago Community Trust and the Fund for Equitable Business Growth, uh, which is a compilation of roughly seven philanthropies. You also see corporations uh, who also ponied up dollars to sponsor different pieces of the program. Um, we had a fuller description of what we did there in the Kaufman Foundation brief. Um, and so if you're interested in that, there's a link here. I know we'll send out materials later on to, to read more about some of the details and how we were able to do that. Um, I want to now go to um, probably a place that is near and dear to many hearts, and that's, that's Philly. Um, you know, and this is actually where I met Sylvie, uh, doing work in the Philadelphia ecosystem. Um, and part of the work of equitable recovery, we believe strongly, is about creating a holistic plan for small business amongst the stakeholders that I just showed you. And so Philly um, is a home of 
uh, you know, a robust small business population has a clusters of main streets and you might find that in your hometowns and your regions, uh, but there are disparities in ownership, employment and revenue for businesses owned by people of color and women. And again, we focused on small. Uh, in this case, it was less than 500 for Philadelphia, but we had an intentional focus for businesses uh, that were, you know, really under 50 uh, employees. And uh, we found out that some of the businesses that were hardest hit by COVID, uh, particularly restaurants, retail, um, were disproportionately affecting business owners of color. And so we wanted to create a holistic strategy that could target certain industries, but also could um, target the needs of this region. And we partnered with Urbane, SourceLink, and eConsult. And I just want to provide with you a framework. Uh, we understood some of the major needs in Philly, which were around access to capital, the a coordinated uh, ecosystem infrastructure to the right, trusted guidance. Uh, Philly found out that it was hard to figure out who do I trust, where do I go? And particularly for business owners of color who tend to have the highest level of mistrust from traditional uh, institutions, and there are, there are big reasons uh, why that is. And then also market opportunities. How can businesses create some of the market opportunities? So what we did as, a, as one of the outcomes of our work together was put together a holistic coalition structure uh, where all of the stakeholder representatives that you saw in that pie chart uh, could buy into a mission and vision of what they wanted to see for a more inclusive uh, environment in Philly. We organized ourselves amongst those needs that I just showed you on the previous page, access to capital, ecosystem infrastructure. And then we had co-chairs for each of those committees uh, that were led by a steering committee that really included United Way, the city of Philadelphia, and one of the major city FIs in the region. Um, that created the crux of a structure. I can't underscore how important that ecosystem infrastructure is to making sure that the plan of execution around a holistic strategy um, is, is, is really uh, built upon. Um, and then um, obviously all of these initiatives needs funding and sponsorship. And so that ecosystem infrastructure has been able to be supported thus far by uh, the funding commitments of, of several others that have played a part in making sure that it can execute on that mission and vision. And so, uh, we've done this work in nine other cities around the country, uh, and those nine particular cities have been recently highlighted in a report that was put out by Liz and Next Street. Uh, and I know we have about a few minutes left, at least for my portion. And I'm gonna I'm gonna just talk a little bit about some of the major themes that came out of doing this type of work in some of the smaller cities. Not every not every city is a Philadelphia. So um, we did smaller cities like uh, Richmond, Virginia, uh, or Indianapolis, uh, or again, think about where you might sit and um, you know, some of the needs. And what we found are some guiding principles. Um, and I just wanna highlight a few here. You can kind of see on the page already, but realizing equity is important and breaking down some of the structural barriers. Um, I wanna uh, really highlight this uh, third piece in terms of developing community base solutions. Um, each solution is informed by one another and should be really mutually reinforcing. This fourth point too around comprehensively, which kind of was a diagram that I showed you in Philadelphia, it might take a different shape in another city and that's great because it gives everybody though a North Star. And that's the important thing. Small businesses can be very confused about not knowing where to go. Uh, but as everyone is really marching to the beat of the same drum, it becomes really easy for people to, and small businesses to figure out, oh, I can go here for this. And if not, I can be referred to here for something else. Um, and then this, one of the last ones I wanna highlight, create new partners, leverage existing ones. You all have to build from your, your assets and your strengths. Uh, and that's gonna be really important. This time, I just wanna pause for uh, the last poll. I just wanna ask, which two guiding principles resonate with you? Um, and so um, all of them, and for the ones, the brief ones that I didn't mention, build on strengths, uh, make a commitment to place, uh, which means that 
sometimes broadening the aperture geograph geographically can be um, you trying to do too much. So pick two that kind of resonate with you. We just kind of want to see um, which ones, only two, can't pick three or four, but I can't test you. So, um, you know, you might, you might cheat. Uh, we're going to close it in five, four, three, two, one. Let's see what people said. Okay, develop community-based solutions and realize equity. Thank you for that. Um, I think those are two really important ones. And again, you can, re you can really read a little bit more on that report, which actually came out today um, around some of the other pieces that can hopefully guide you in your own journey. Um, I'm just gonna wrap up in these last couple of slides in um, just pointing you out to, uh, you know, I showed you that pie chart of the different organizational types. Uh, what I now want to orient you to as we kind of, you know, wrap up here, at least this part, is that there are different roles to play, whether you're a service provider, a capital provider, an innovator, a capacity builder, a funder, a convener, an advocate, or an instigator. And um, I, I can... I could have talked three hours just on this page alone uh, in terms of what that means and the details, but hopefully the names are pretty self-explanatory um, and they, they aren't mutually exclusive. Some stakeholders can play more than one role, uh, but it's just important to know that these are the types of roles that are needed, needed to build a comprehensive plan and really spur toward action. Um, and um, lastly, I want to just highlight, uh, particularly for any of what you all connected to some of the funding streams, um, this uh, another report that was produced with the, the nine cities with Common Future. Um, it's really about understanding also the role of funders. And so if that's something that you wanna dig into more, I'm gonna point you there and save you from reading a little bit of the text. But uh, again, everybody has a role to play. And so, um, again, you know, I started out with these fundamental beliefs. The small business infrastructure is broken. Uh, we have to kind of sit with that. And I know, again, it can be jarring, but we are all working within it and around it, um, the traditional system while changing it. And we each have a role to play. And so uh, that's what I want to leave you with. These, these last two pages, uh, two resources for you, and we'll send these out afterwards. Um, we've already had about 500 ecosystem builders and consider yourself an ecosystem builder, someone committed to building the small business ecosystem, sharing resources, sharing presentations, sharing uh, different strategies. Um, you can put your phone up to the QR code or wait till we send it out. Uh, but basically you can link up with others. I'll call you small business heroes uh, in and around uh, the country. Um, Again, free access to content and courses and resources. And then lastly, we just launched with Verizon um, and, and a free resource for the small businesses in your area. Uh, their goal is to build over 1 million, uh, provide over 1 million small businesses with resources. And so this is about closing the digital uh, divide and a small businesses, again, get free access to a lot of asynchronous learning modules around personalized learning coaching and peer networking. So hopefully this could also be useful in your efforts. So I'll pause there and just want to thank you for the opportunity to share a little bit about our view on building an equitable small business ecosystem. Awesome. That was great. Thank you so much, Sharice. Um, so I think there's a million takeaways from Sharice's presentation, but three that I capture that I'll highlight before we hand over to Jen. So that statistic about how linked entrepreneurship is to wealth creation. I think that's when we have to spread the gospel around the five times the wealth in families and 10 times the wealth in, in Black families is, is really incredible. Um, and I didn't know that statistic before today. So, <laughs> um, And, you know, the capital, capital, capital. I know we hear it all the time, but just how critical that is for businesses. And lastly, just all the different players in an ecosystem. And you, I'm sure you've heard about ecosystems and you will continue to hear about ecosystems. And the specifics of how to really get um, an ecosystem to work for entrepreneurs in your community. So um, thank you, Sharice. Now I'm going to kick it over to Jen to present. Thank you so much. Um, hopefully you can now see my screen. 
Okay, well, thank you all for having me today. And we had so much material just flood us there. So I, I'm hoping that you will join me in doing a little body practice because I know we often get so much in our heads in this work and I like to remain in our hearts a little bit. So I have done this practice for years, but um, it's from a book called My Grandmother's Hands. It's all about healing racialized trauma for all people. He refers to um, people of culture um, and uh, I can't remember what he calls white people. Anyway, um, we all have racialized trauma and, you know, sort of goes through all of the, the ways that that happens. But this is a practice from the book I did for years. And then he did it on this podcast on being and recorded the audio. So I'm just going to let uh, Resma Menachem take us through just a couple of minutes. In terms of a practice, this is a very simple practice. If you're listening to me right now, one of the things I want you to do is I want you to just to sit for a second. And I want you just to stare straight ahead. Just look straight ahead and as you're looking straight ahead just notice what is actually landed and what is actually still kind of in the air all you're doing is just kind of noticing what's happening noticing how much you dislike my voice noticing how much you dislike or you like uh, some of the things that Krista said. No, just notice those pieces. Now what I want you to do is look over your left shoulder and use your neck and your hips. So turn and look over your shoulder. And then come back to center and now look up and look down, come back to center, and now look over your right shoulder using your neck and your hips. And the reason why you use your neck and your hips is I want you to engage that psoas and engage the, some parts of the, the vagal. And then now come forward. And now just be quiet and notice what's different. In terms of a practice, this is a very simple practice. If you're listening to me right now, in terms of a practice, this is a very simple practice. If you're listening to me right now, one of the things I want you to do is... I'll All right, forget that. I don't know. So why that <laughs> went so poorly. Um, so I would really appreciate if you take a minute in the chat and just share, what did you notice? What do you feel? And what do you need? You can just pop your thoughts into the chat and I'll keep going while you start thinking about those things. So we have a, a lot of material to cover today. Um, and I'm gonna start with some introductions to myself and to NLC. I'm gonna give you an overview of the City Innovation Ecosystems Program, which is our core economic development program. Um, we're going to talk some about strategies for resilient, inclusive growth and the things that we've found in our program over the last few years. And I'm going to give you a quick crib on using American Rescue Plan Act dollars to support small businesses. But I'll tell you up front, while we're not rushed, which we might be as we get to the end, that NLC has a lot of resources on our website um, and invite you to check those out for American Rescue Plan and small businesses. Um, and then we'll go through some further resources at the end. And so I'm seeing a lot of things about the tension, the stress, the ways that things sit in your body. I think that's something that a lot of us carry. And this has been an incredibly stressful time for all of us. Um, so sometimes it's good to just pause and take a moment and let our bodies settle so that we can then bring our brains back to the work. Um, and uh, so, yeah, just to reset ourselves. Um, and one of the reasons that you also do that orientation work is because sometimes our animal brain in those transitions, it, it hasn't really had a chance to settle. So it just needs it to know that you're safe and that there's nothing lurking behind you. And just looking over your shoulder, looking around the room can help your body to know that you're safe. Um, and that can help us to connect to people because really this is all about community, right? And this is all about um, creating more inclusion and more justice. 
and being more open to connecting with one another. So who are we at the National League of Cities? Um, we are the voice of America's cities, towns, and villages. We speak on behalf of 19,000 municipalities across the nation. We've got nearly 3,000 member cities um, and also have membership from the 49 state municipal league. So we represent a lot of people and a lot of communities across the country. Our mission is to strengthen local leadership and to influence federal policy and drive innovative solutions. Um, and I am the Director of Economic Development Entrepreneurship, but I want to go beyond my bios. You can look me up on LinkedIn if you want my resume, but I want to take a little time today to share my personal history and what brings me to this work. So I was born in Buffalo, I was raised in Pittsburgh, I live in Providence, Rhode Island, I work in Washington, DC. So I'm a legacy city person through and through. And these are my parents in 1971, their 50th anniversary is this December, I'm knitting them a giant blanket. Um, hopefully we'll be done by December. Um, so my parents, when I was growing up were both professionals um, and they were white collar small business owners and I grew up working for them. Um, they were in school when I was a, a kid and then opened their businesses. Um, and I've had firsthand experience of intergenerational wealth building and really was raised to understand um, the injustice that of the policies that let that happen. Um, and I got into economic development work after having a 20 year career in social justice policy advocacy, because I understood that with the gender changing demographics of our nation, I could have a conversation about race equity and economic inequality with people who were not interested in talking about racial justice from a social equity perspective. These are my dad's grand, my, my grandparents, my dad's parents, um, Ada and Teddy Steinfeld. My grandfather was a child of immigrants and he had an eighth grade education. He started a window washing business and was able to send three children to graduate school. And when he died, he left me the money that I used for the down payment on my home. That's intergenerational wealth in action. My grandfather was Jewish, and when he went to basic training in Texas in 1941, many of the men he met there had never met a Jew, and he said that he was frequently asked with all sincerity if he would show them his horns. Um, in three generations, we've been assimilated into whiteness, and my sister and I have always had the experience of being accepted as white within society, although I don't know, the last few years have been a little rough. I don't know if we're, we're still all the way in. Um, and that's always made me realize how fungible those categories are, but also how incredibly impactful they are in people's lives. Because my grandfather, as a World War II veteran, had access to support for starting a small business and building a home through the GI Bill that were not available to Black vets. And that's white supremacy in action. So as I said, communities across the country now are becoming more and more diverse, and we are not addressing the racial wealth gap. If we don't get our arms around the racial wealth divide, we cannot continue to thrive. Economies that leave their people behind collapse. So those are a lot of the driving principles uh, that I carry with me in this work. And before coming to NLC, I worked for the city of Providence and I was an implementation lead in the city innovation ecosystems program. That's how I found out about the program um, and how I wound up coming to NLC. So our, my perspective, um, I think really helps make our program user friendly. We're in our third year of running it right now and um, we're really centering racial equity. Our theory of change is that entrepreneurship and small business ownership is a path to financial security and a key lever for addressing that racial wealth divide. Our program's mission is to catalyze the uptake and implementation of policies, programs, and practices that support inclusive entrepreneurship-led economic growth in American cities. We're helping cities implement policies, programs, and practices that help them support diverse and inclusive entrepreneurs. Um, and so we're really looking at increasing economic opportunity for Black, Indigenous, Hispanic, and other people of color, and women and non-binary people. Um, and I think sometimes people think about those as all separate categories, but they can be, people can be all of those things at any one time. Um, we're looking to identify and reward city leaders who are harnessing that power of their local ecosystem, which Sharice talked about so, care, uh, so uh, incredibly well, um, and really harnessing their community's creativity. 
And then we provide catalytic funding uh, to support them in the implementation. Uh, and we support cities at around $15,000 um, per city, and they leverage that on average four to one. We have many cities that leverage significantly more than that. Our program has three main channels of supporting uh, city action and peer learning, which is we provide direct technical assistance. Um, so whether they're talking to us, our staff as experts, or we also contract with um, specific program experts with uh, specific content expertise. And in the next slide, I'll show you what our menu of options look like and who all of those leaders are. We have quarterly cohort calls um, where we have cities share their best practices and talk about what's going on there. Um, and then we do multimedia engagement and info sharing. So we have a monthly webinar on a topic of relevance. Uh, we did a lot on ARPA last year, as well as on um, COVID recovery and economic development. We have a newsletter that goes out once a month um, and we use blog posts as well as research embedded case studies on city actions. And the way the program works is that cities choose one or occasionally more than one um, item from our menu of opportunity. These are four buckets of, uh, of growth areas that were identified by the Kauffman Foundation, which is also our funder. And for anyone else who's in the nonprofit sector and working on entrepreneurship, um, probably connected to them as well. Um, one of the places we focused a lot on in the last year is the procurement issue. So Sharice talked a lot about access to capital and we'll talk more about access to capital. And we have quite a number of forms of access to capital here, um, but where cities move their real money is through the procurement process. And this year we've added uh, not only working on public procurement and what the city procurement process is, but also helping cities work with their anchor institutions and their local community to increase diversity of suppliers to their private procurement as well. Um, and in this past year, which is just wrapping up and we're just about to launch our new cohort of programs. We had 51 cities, we made 31 grants, we provided 750 hours of technical assistance. As I said, leveraging the funding that we provide more than four to one, um, and which was more than $2 million in new investments during this COVID year. Um, we had over 150 partner organizations across our 51 cities. Um, and 42 of those cities achieved the output of their commitment by May 1st, um, and we kicked off in September. So by the end of September, we anticipate that we'll have all 51 of them there. And we're currently kicking off our program. Program registration is closed, but if you wanna join, we do have a few slots available. So this is me um, just doing a little pitch for the program. Uh, we will be kicking off formally in November, although we have some pre-work for cities to do. Um, so if you're interested, send me an email and we'll see if we can get you into the program. Okay, now I have a poll as, oh no, I'm gonna go over my key findings first, I think. Yeah, key findings. So um, we have six things that we've found over the course of two and a half years of this program. Um, and as Sheree said, you know, racism is really built into our system and it's built in there so strongly that race neutral policies uphold racism. And I think that's really hard for a lot of policymakers to get that if we keep doing the same thing, we are upholding that racist system. And that's true for other systemic equalities that are built into that inequalities that are built into this system. So if you really want to address equity, it has to be at the heart of your program. And it's slow work, it's not immediate work, and it can be really challenging, but that is an excuse not to give up, but to dig in. So a quote I take to heart all the time is something Arthur Ashe said, start where you are, use what you have, and do what you can, but you have to make you know, intentional steps towards working into equity. It's not enough just to tack it on at the end. Uh, as I said, procurement is where cities move their real money. So grants and loan funds are excellent. Um, we're not telling anyone to take them away, but if you don't get at equity in the procurement process, um, then you're not really making systemic change at scale. 
And most procurement policies are built around transparency and bureaucracy, not equity and uh, usability from that end user. So we did a whole toolkit this year on how you can build equity into your procurement process. GARE has a great guide as well. There are a lot of people doing work in this space just in the last, I would say maybe two years that there's a lot of focus on it. If you need more resources, let me know. Um, Access to capital, it's critical. Increasing actual cash money for businesses is so important for building an, e an equitable ecosystem of entrepreneurship. So many people have been systemically excluded from our systems and thus to accumulating that individual and community wealth that helps small businesses grow. But at the same time, access to capital is not enough. That historic exclusion was not only exclusion from access to money, so other forms of connections to expertise, social networks, clients, and collaborators are key. If a business is not set up for success, just providing money is not enough. Um, an ecosystem approach is critical to supporting resilient economies and cities can't and shouldn't do it alone. So that means partnering with local community organizations, community colleges, SBA resource centers, community banks, community development and financing organizations, and other local and regional resources to support economic growth. City leaders are excellent conveners and getting the right people in the room can be a huge step forward. And then finally, um, and a lot of you talked about the uh, understanding the programs that exist, asset mapping both strengthens linkages and identifies gaps. So all ecosystems are complex by definition, but we have seen many cities where there's a lack of connectivity between the nodes or where entrepreneurship support organizations don't know each other and they can't provide warm handoffs for businesses as they progress or where there are critical gaps that can provide growth opportunities for local organizations. So use that convening power to look at who is doing what for whom and what's missing, and then create an actual roadmap, like actually draw it out for small businesses and entrepreneurs in your community to use. And now I have a poll. Um, so of these six findings, which of them resonate most with you? And we'll just leave it open for a minute. Okay, let's see what we got. I actually can't, oh, there we go, okay. Okay, great, so looks like, those, are, those were my two too, equity must be built in, not tacked on, and access to capital is not enough. Those are the two that really stood out for me. Those were not things that um, I felt like were really core to my work before I started really doing this work. So I'm um, interesting to see that those resonate with you as well. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about the American Rescue Plan Act. Um, so NLC was really at the heart of the lobbying effort around this. And in March 2021, Congress passed this act, which included $65 billion local fiscal recovery fund with direct aid to all 19,000 of the nation's municipalities. And these funds were designed to help with recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic by really stabilizing three groups, your local government operations, including your lost revenue and any workforce impacts, households and individuals that had been disproportionately impacted by COVID-19 and small businesses disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. That's just the Local Fiscal Recovery Act. Um, there's also an equivalent $65 billion or so that went to the Small Business Administration. There's another $3 billion at um, the Economic Development Administration. So there's a lot of funding out there that is relating to economies. So we developed five principles for ARPA implementation, um, which is all about, first of all, assessing what's going on and making sure that you're engaging your residents and your stakeholders. Um, and we've seen a lot of communities that are really pushing to move quickly, that's great, but you don't have to obligate these funds uh, for another two years and you don't have to spend them for five. So it's worth taking a pause to make sure you know what your residents need. 
Um, as I said, the local fiscal recovery fund is just a small portion of this $1.9 trillion bill. So make sure you're using each revenue source strategically. If you want to work on housing, there's money specifically for that. Um, if you're, uh, I think all of you probably get CDBG month funds, but you've gotten additional funding through that that can be used for housing. There's some competitive grant funds, et cetera. Um, and then use your most flexible fund, that local fiscal recovery fund, to create that connective tissue between those programs. Prioritize fiscal stability and equitable recovery. So again, we're really building equity in um, and looking long-term at what will help you um, create a strong and stable program or community for the future. And then of course, there's a lot of administration around it. So maintaining records and documenting the impact that you're having. And finally, this was a controversial piece of legislation. It was the first time um, that every city and town in the country got direct funding from Congress. So making sure that Congress knows what's been going on in your community is part of your success. So just loop them in, invite them to ribbon cuttings. Um, if you're doing newsletters, make sure that your congressional delegation is part of that process as well. So with a focus on equity, ARPA funds can be used to support the economic engine of small businesses and to address the way that low wage workers were disproportionately impacted by COVID. And you can and should use an equity lens when making your plans for ARPA investments. Um, a lot of the, the information that Cherie shared on why small businesses is in here, um, but there was also a really significant and disparate harm for low wage workers. And I'm sure you know that low wage workers are overwhelmingly people of color and overwhelmingly women. Um, and so those low wage jobs disproportionately require in-person frontline work um, and really were a part of the, the job losses, whether those were service positions um, or other types of, of entry level positions. And a lot of those jobs aren't coming back. There's been a lot of automation that has taken a lot of those jobs away. So what do you need to keep in mind when you're thinking about small business expenditures? You've got to keep in mind that COVID related harm. This is about uh, addressing the economic harm that came from or was exacerbated by this public health emergency. So that can be immediate or it can be delayed. It doesn't necessarily mean only supporting the restaurants that are closed for periods of time during um, the beginning of the pandemic. It can be something um, where there's been a change to a business sector. Um, but as I said, you know, we always want to be thinking about not just throwing money at a business that isn't set up for success. So think about um, also what are the other supports you can provide for communities. Um, and then you have a lot of flexibility around how you use it. Um, you should consider what your local economic conditions are, what you know about the businesses in your community, what you know about the different neighborhoods and communities in your community, um, and making sure that you are, are building in intentionally um, support for those businesses that have less capacity to weather those financial hardships. So your smallest businesses, those that have less access to credit or those that are serving disadvantaged communities. And so I will say we have this example here about loan and grant funds, um, and you can definitely use funding to do that. But we strongly recommend that you think about sustainability and transformation when you think about your local funding and not just plugging an immediate hole. For instance, rather than making like $500 emergency grants to businesses that have been turned down for loans, consider making a partnership with a local community college or a CDFI or SBA resource center to provide credit counseling and business development programming that helps strengthen those local businesses to be competitive for private state and federal funding over the long term, because this is once in a generation funding. And I have a, a second poll we can pop up now, I think. So just curious to get a pulse check on where your community is in your process of ARPA implementation. And maybe you don't know, and that's okay. And if you think that I'm missing a category, please throw that in the chat as well. Um, these are sort of things that have been changing over time. All right, let's close that poll up. All right, so just getting started. Well, that's the perfect place to be because that's um, 
it gives you time to really build and be thoughtful. And I like hearing that. Some of you are making investments already um, and 21% of you need help. So NLC is here to provide help. Um, I'm sure you're gonna get my email address and information and I'm gonna throw in the chat we're gonna have to close out this and find the link and then throw it in the chat during the Q&A, but I will get it for you. Um, we actually have a webinar next week on Wednesday with the Economic Development Authority about how your community can access those $3 billion in EDA funds. Um, and they have a, quite a number of programs. And as I said, we have a lot of other resources available on our site. So we have um, a COVID-19 hub. We just updated it this week and so i'm actually not totally sure that that where that qr code is going to take you i, I gotta check that um i should have checked that before this and i didn't even think about it um, but we just updated our covid 19 hub to separate out um, american rescue plan act and recovery resources from the kind of immediate pandemic response and relief page um, and we also have a question form, um, which we're in, in weekly conversations with the Treasury Department and they're producing additional guidance. So it's really helpful for us if you have questions, if you include them in our form, because you might not be the only one with those questions and we can take those back to Treasury in aggregate because we speak to so many cities um, and let them know where people are confused. And we know that there is a lot of concern, especially from smaller communities right now about the reporting and data collection at this current moment. So I wanted to share you some specific resources. Um, we put out this year a municipal action guide that's specifically about inclusive procurement and contracting. Um, we have a recorded webinar specifically about increasing equitability and in procurement. We did a Q&A session about how ARPA is impacting small businesses with some small business leaders. Um, and we have a fact sheet about leveraging fiscal recovery funds specifically to support small businesses. So these are just a few of our resources. Um, and we also have a conference that we just this week um, pivoted from online and um, from in person and online hybrid, hybrid event to an online uh, conference session. So it will actually be November 17th through 20th. Um, uh, but City Summit is a conference that I went to when I was a city employee that was really incredibly powerful for me. I worked in a mid-sized city that had really small departments, and so it was great to connect with colleagues who were thinking about the same things that I was thinking about. And if I can do another pitch for my uh, city innovation ecosystem program, if you register for the program, we will include registration for the conference um, with your enrollment in the program. We have grant funds to offset the cost. Um, and so you can join us as part of inclusion um, in the program cohort. So that is all for me, um, but I know we'll be here for some Q&A and, uh, and happy to hear from all of you. That was perfect. Thanks so much, Jen. Um, so just a few uh, takeaways so that I give equal treatment because that was amazing. Um, so you mentioned what was, what was the, that list in that poll of what, what was your biggest takeaway? And one of the things that you said that um, I wrote down that wasn't in that poll was race neutral policies uphold racism, which I think in the spirit of spreading the gospel earlier, I said about the wealth creation potential of entrepreneurship, that that phrase is pretty powerful. Um, you also said um, capital is not enough and the importance of procurement um, processes. Um, and you guys have that resource, it's available. Um, I don't know if it covers payment processes for governments, but that's that's another part that they trip some small businesses and minority businesses up when they do get those opportunities. Um, and uh, and cities can't do it alone. So um, really great. There were not a ton of questions, but I do have a couple that I captured um, that I will read out before we just open it up. So um, and apologies if I mispronounce any names, but Mishu, um, said, can you briefly talk about, um, this is to Sharice, your work with NDC and CRF? Sure, um, thank you for the question. Uh, we've worked, for those of you unfamiliar um, with NDC, um, National Development Corporation based out of New York City, uh, they are a community development financial institution. They do small business lending, also work in affordable housing. And their whole mission is to try and create thriving uh, economies across the country. 
Uh, we help them specifically in developing a strategic plan and particularly focus on their small business lending portfolio. Uh, related to our desire and, and as we do with many clients, uh, work toward how they as an organization can do more um, and grow over the next couple of years in particularly their small business lending portfolio. Uh, with CRF, Community Reinvestment um, Fund, based out of the Twin Cities, uh, we also help them on their uh, five-year growth plan, which uh, they also predominantly do small business lending, but also do some uh, work in housing as well. And as part of one of the, the major outputs of their plan, uh, many of you might be familiar with, uh, their platform is called Connect to Capital, which is about connecting businesses with flexible capital. Uh, but we help them develop that plan. We help them make sure that they had their own theory of change, particularly to have out outcomes that they wanted to have on the small business um, environment. And then you know, we worked with them over several years after that to execute on that strategic plan. Great, thanks, Sharice. Um, and then the other question was from um, Juana Jean. Um, asking for the, um, when you, and this is also for you, Sharice, when you talked about the Cook County program, um, how, how did you identify the key competencies of the organizations that, uh, um, to which you referred the applicants? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so when we launched that Cook County program, we had the intentionality of, of reaching business owners of color um, spread out across the city and county of Cook. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that the partners providing the business advice and assistance, one, um, had a geographical reach. Um, and when I say the partners, we started with, with three main partners, the Women's Business Development uh, Center there, the uh, Chicago uh, Urban League, and the Illinois Hispanic Chamber. Um, and so we have representative groups for, for women and uh, two dominant um, groups of, of color. Uh, the Urban League focuses a lot on uh, the black population. And so with them first, uh, we got their recommendations on who they've been working with. And we had everyone really fill out a survey, quite frankly. I mean, that was the only way to also keep it fair and equitable. Um, they had to highlight uh, what services they provide today, um, how they would intend to reach uh, small businesses and entrepreneurs, um, what was their staff capacity like, um, and if it was lower, you know, what were their plans to kind of build it, and so we, we wanted to understand their, their core strengths and wanted to understand kind of where they were uh, within the ecosystem. Great, thank you. So now I want to open it up, um, and I think maybe the best way is to either put the little raised hand or raise your hand physically if you can't find the raised hand. Um, and I will call on you. And if I don't call on you, it's because I have to flip through three different screens, but. And Sylvia, I, I think that when they raise their hand, they should come to the first screen. So I oh, see, great. yeah, I see Adam has his hand to kick us off. Thank you, Sloan. You're welcome. <laughs> Adam, please. Yeah, so I was personally surprised that the definition of small business was as large as 500. So I'm wondering if there is any data that kind of nails that down a little bit and kind of segments that out a little, because I know just thinking in my head anecdotally, it feels like the businesses that are closing are kind of our corner stores or our other smaller storefronts that don't have anywhere close to even 100 employees. Absolutely, I can, I can tackle that one. Um, Adam, you're absolutely right. I mean, the definition is large. And uh, I'll come back to one of the points I raised, which is, you know, of the 32 million here in the country, you know, 80% um, are, and just that's just right around 24 uh, million are uh, sole proprietors. So the majority of businesses in this country are super small. <laughs> right. And uh, right above the sole proprietors, I mean, uh, a lot of attention is going to venture capital, which obviously plays a huge role in our economy. 
Um, but it's a very small sliver in terms of those high growth, just a few million um, of that 32 million. And, and in between is sort of the moderate growth. So you have the high growth, a couple million in the country, uh, the majority of sole proprietors, and then you kind of have the in-between, some of your more kind of more mainstream and uh, moderately growth businesses. So when we do this work of ecosystem building, I think the spirit of your question is making sure that we can segment the data. Um, and I would argue in addition to size of employee by revenue and by industry, um, there's a great tool, I'll drop it in a chat, um, out of Drexel as part of the Small Business Equity Toolkit, which when we next street do a lot of the data and analysis and segmentation, we can cut the data by 20 employees, 50 employees, right? Um, this Small Business Equity Tool, uh, it automatically pulls a lot of the data from the census, which can be very cumbersome. And you can search for it um, for your uh, locale and your county. A lot of the data is by county. Um, and you can sort of segment by race, by ethnicity, um, and by size. So I'll drop down in the tool and hopefully that'll help you in, in where you are, Lancaster, PA. Thanks, Sharice. One thing I would add to that, Adam, um, because I also was pretty involved in the city of Philadelphia in doing um, COVID recovery grants. One of the things that we did was um, for small businesses, you know, each size kind of needs something different. And so for the smaller businesses, um, we ended up doing, you know, more than 2,000 of the grants were for businesses up to, I think, 500,000. And then from 500,000 to, I think, 2 million was forgivable loans up to 25,000 or something like that. And a lot of it was about the jobs being saved. And then there was um, a, a larger size forgivable loans for the bigger ones. But we learned afterwards that you really have to look at who's employed and, and really if those businesses could have accessed capital in a you know outside of that process to really be to really be equitable in the process. So that was a that was a key learning that we had. So looking for other hands here. I saw a lot of comments in the chat around that folks are just getting started with the ARPA dollars. So I don't know if there are any questions around there. Uh, Todd, it looks like you've got a question. Sure, this is also directed at Sharice. Uh, I appreciate um, Next Street. What you guys are doing is fabulous stuff. So thank you for, for being with us. Um, you mentioned when you were working in Cook County that you, as part of that process, had identified the need to develop new sort of delivery channels for some of the technical assistance that was going on um, to try to reach the, the target businesses that you were after. Could you talk a little bit about what those kind of new delivery channels felt like or what they looked like and why there was a need for them? Um, thank you for that question. I appreciate it. Um, and I'll, I'll answer it in, in, in two ways. Um, one, in terms of delivery channel, uh, I mean to make sure that we, we're reaching uh, in terms of intentionally reaching the businesses that we want to reach whether geography or by demographic. And so uh, the compilation of partners that we had and to the other question around how do we decide which partners to work with and collaborate with, we want to, we first did some of the asset mapping that we're talking, that we've been talking about, Jen and myself, and tried to figure out where there are pocket, pockets of underrepresentation of business service organizations. And if there were no business service organizations in particular areas, how could we get some of those partners that worked in other areas of the county to, to do more there. Um, so we had intentional marketing, uh, PR, uh, making sure that the distribution of information uh, was through partners that, that also had the trust of small businesses in and around them, but also could um, recommend other uh, service providers that, that could also be part of the platform. The second thing I would say is in terms of the distribution and you know, COVID, a lot of people couldn't come to the regular brick and mortar centers, which was an opportunity because we were able to meet businesses where they are, which is sort of on demand. Um, and so we were able to create some standardized webinars 
uh, that we could distribute through these partners uh, that we had curated uh, through that process that I just described, and now have some stickiness with businesses that that perhaps were never also introduced to uh, some of these partners. And we use the platform called Submittable, which is a technology that underpent the website that all businesses could go to. And that allowed us to have a very intricate, sophisticated on the back end way to have that connective tissue between businesses and the service providers that they were uh, assigned to. Um, so hopefully that, that kind of gets to your question. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. And it looks like there's a question in the chat here. Are there good resources available for smaller than small businesses which emerge in smaller communities? And this is from Tim. So micro businesses. And either of you, I don't know, either of you feel free. Jen, do you want to kick that off? Sure. There are many resources, but I don't have like a, like here's the, the Bible of it, but there is a lot of focus on the smallest businesses. Um, and honestly, I feel like because the first round of the Paycheck Protection Program went so poorly, there's been a lot of government focus on the smallest businesses as well. Um, and so I think we'll be seeing more resources. But um, I'm not sure what assets you have in your local community, but the SBA offices, whether that's a, a SCORE center or SBA or Women's Development Center, they're all very used to working with um, the smallest businesses and to helping those businesses. Your local chamber can be a really great place um, to provide support and services. And you might find that there are entrepreneurship support organizations in your community or in your county um, and, and beyond um, that are focusing on those businesses and you might find that there aren't and then that's a business opportunity for someone who wants to provide those supports and services as well so sometimes um, when you start looking around if there's something missing um, there's a lot of information and in fact sba has a whole curriculum on providing business coaching to the smallest businesses um, that is available for free so you can definitely check that out great thanks jen and i see sharice just dropped a link um, in the chat resource. There's a great question here, which could probably spark a very lengthy dialogue <laughs> um, from um, Tess, which is a question for Sharice Jenner, any city employees about um, whether any cities or if you guys know of any cities tracking any minority women and veteran owned statistics outside of MWBE certification um, and that they're looking for ways to collect data and statistics. Um, there's a way to engage during business registration. Yeah, so I know that a lot of communities across the country were really surprised at um, what they don't know about their communities. And I also know that a lot of communities when, especially when Paycheck Protection and the Restaurant Relief Fund came forward, they required businesses to be certified. And a lot of communities did not realize how many um, businesses in their communities are not necessarily um, totally up to snuff with all of their certification and all of their paperwork. And so then they weren't even eligible to be able to apply for some of these relief funds. And a lot of the state grant funds also required them to show all of their business licenses. Um, and so I would say when I worked in the city of Providence, we collected information um, only from bidders for government contracts. We didn't have anything on the business forms, like the business license application forms about demographics. Um, and so when I was there, we added that and it was optional, but I would say probably about 75% of people filled it out just to help us get a sense as to who was starting businesses in our community. Um, and we put it on a separate sheet from the actual application. So it actually tore off your application and just kind of went into a like a demographic file, uh, because I know a lot of people were really uncomfortable. They thought if they were identifying themselves as, a, as someone who'd been historically excluded, that that wouldn't be, um, wouldn't be positive for their business certification process. So um, there are lots of ways to be creative about how you collect that data, but there are not a lot of places that are actually collecting it or collecting it in a systemic way. Um, and 
I totally understand why. And then also it makes it really hard to know what's really going on in your community and who's starting businesses. So one of the um, menu items in our community, in our program of CIE is um, looking at informal entrepreneurs and supporting informal entrepreneurs. Um, and so we have a lot of folks who are working in the arts, but also a lot of people who are um, what somebody in our program calls kitchen beauticians um, or doing home catering companies or other types of service businesses that are not necessarily licensed. And um, people may or may not want that to be their main job or it may be their main source of income, um, but they aren't necessarily looking to get themselves licensed. Um, and some people very much are, or they didn't know that there was some licensing that they needed to get. And so um, really working with your community um, and intermediaries in your community can be really helpful. There's often a lot of like faith-based business support groups. Um, you might have a minority chamber, et cetera, to just kind of get your arms around what's out there. Thanks, Jen. I think I can um, say from my experience in the city of Philadelphia that the certification process, it's really, it's very flawed system. <laughs> um, you know, it's not, it takes a long time for a lot of people to get certified. And for a lot of businesses, there's no real Th th there isn't a benefit. So when it comes to small businesses and grant programs, you know, a lot of them are not necessarily doing business with government. And so they wouldn't get it. So um, I do think that that's something that that merits a lot of discussion and, and future thinking. I'll just put it that way. Um, but certainly to the any wherever there can be um, collection of those demographics, it's really, really helpful for, for developing new programs, for knowing that who benefited for understanding, you know, like I said before, some of the larger businesses that in the initially got grants from the city of Philadelphia probably could have gotten their own loans. Um, so just having that data helps you to really understand what's working and not working and how to pivot or, or make small adjustments. Um, I don't know, Sharice, it looks like you have some things to add too. Thanks, so yeah, just to build on what you were just saying and Jen a bit, I just wanna share a brief screenshot from the actual application we used for the Cook County work. Um, which didn't require certification. And again, our intent was to reach uh, business owners of color. And so we wanted to make sure we weren't falling under the same traps that have sometimes prevented them from getting funding. So um, this is it, and this is just uh, a PDF. I PDF'd it um, at the time, but you can see, I'm gonna just scroll down. Uh, you, you had to mark uh, your race and what gender you identified with. Is your business majority woman owned, um, owned by a minority um, as defined here, um, veteran owned, but it, it wasn't a qualification for receiving the fund. So we started this intake form and every six months we, we have uh, go out, out to the same group of businesses uh, about at least 20 different questions on the impact and their revenues, their profitability, and so we can track over time. This ability to measure and data is, is like a pain point for everybody. Uh, but to the extent that you can be consistent and have the right technology to collect and standardize amongst all of your grantees and applications, I think can bode really, really well for you. Um, and so I just wanna encourage you to um, you know, keep, keep pushing the envelope in terms of the intent that you wanna have and then designing a system and a process that, that, that really tries to meet that intent. Thank you. There is another question related from, uh, I don't know if it's Sully or Suli, I apologize. Um, but it around, if you guys are familiar with any softwares or data systems that communities can engage with to track all the technical assistance that's offered and to capture demographics. So if you have a city um, contact CRM, what is that? I don't know what that stands for. But anyway, if you have a city tool that you're using, like Salesforce or something else, you can configure that to capture this data. Um, you also, if you are making grants, uh, like Sharice mentioned, Submittable is a really great platform. Um, and they're pretty affordable online. We use them as well for our regranting program. Um, and they help us track everything all in one place. And we we also collect information around that. Oh, thank you, Sharice. I was like, what is the R? <laughs> so it's customer relationship management, right? Um, so there are a million tools out there and they're at all different price points. Um, 
I know when I worked in the nonprofit sector, we use something sometimes called little green light, which is one. Um, so, you know, Salesforce is really the, the big player in that space, but there are a ton of different resources out there. And depending on how detailed you need to be, there's a lot that's available free if you're just sort of keeping, you know, something that's a step up from a, a spreadsheet. Great. Well, we have two minutes left. So I don't know, Ali or Sloan, if you had any kind of closing or. Um, I've got a couple of closing remarks. If there's one last question, we probably got time for that. Otherwise, we'll be circulating, um, circulating John and Teresa's uh, contact information if you have follow up questions. Um, and similarly, I just want to thank Teresa and John again for kicking off the small business presentations with some really excellent um, expertise and resources. Um, we will be circulating today's recording, their slides, and all of the resources that were dropped in the chat later today. Um, and also please keep an eye out for an invitation to an upcoming optional drop-in session with a member of the Fed's research team um, that's focused on COVID-19 and household financial well-being um, that includes data for the specific cohort community. So we'll also send that information out today. Um, if you have any questions out of that session or the next small business session in a couple of weeks, just feel free to reach out to Sloan and myself. Um, otherwise, we look forward to seeing you guys again soon. And um, thanks again. And I, I'll just, just since yeah. I won't see people before next Thursday. Well, actually, that's what I'm trying to say. There, I have office hours next Tuesday um, for um, anyone who's interested as well. So thank you all. That right. was, thank you so much. We'll see you soon. Take care, everyone.